Welcome everybody to um, tonight's installment. Uh, actually, it's the last installment of 2021. Um, our stargazing uh, introduction to stargazing and natural night skies presentation. Um, we have um, a few partners that are involved in this. Uh, it is the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. That really is is our major partner in this. Um, they uh, they really like to see a lot more community engagement around um, stargazing, especially out here in the dark Oregon outback. So thank you the, uh, to the Dark Sky Network. And then we have four libraries um, that are also uh, mostly from um, the southeastern Oregon region that are uh, that advertise the event. So we have the Ontario Community Library here in Ontario, where I'm uh, broadcasting from, the Vale Community of Li Library, which is um, just about 20 miles to the west, the Harney County Library in Harney County, the adjacent county to Malheur, and then also uh, last time and this time the McDermott Library out of McDermott, Nevada, which is um, right on the border between Oregon and Nevada, so really close to Oregon and really close to the um, Owyhee watershed. So we're really happy that McDermott can be a part of this too. Um, I was hoping to broadcast from McDermott tonight, um, however, two factors, one, weather, we should be getting some snow tonight, um, and, and two, they actually have their youth holiday um, concert tonight, so I wouldn't be surprised if nobody from McDermott was able to make it tonight so they could watch the kiddos sing. Well, um, as I've said, uh, my name is Sammy Castingway, and I'm the programs director here at Friends of the Owyhee. And I'm also um, part-time Earth System Science Instructor at Treasure Valley Community College here out of Ontario, Oregon. And uh, part of that position does involve, uh, I teach astronomy in the wintertime. So uh, I'm a geologist by background, using my boots and rock hammer to crawl around on the land. Uh, but years ago, camping in the summertime with students year after year, uh, I found that relatively few of us, uh, surprisingly, that camp or, or be out in the night sky, look up at the night sky and no constellations. So year, year after year, um, hearing myself say to students, no, I don't know any of those constellations, I decided to learn. So a lot of this stuff, um, my knowledge started uh, just you know, by books and presentations and getting to know the night sky, so an amateur. Uh, I also took a planetary geology class, so I'm kind of more um, in touch with the geology of other planets uh, than necessarily the whole cosmology of the universe. And then um, teaching at Treasure Valley Community College, I've really gotten a chance to dive in uh, really deep throughout the year looking at constellations. And that's something I'm going to invoke tonight is to talk about um, how special it is to do stargazing uh, day or night um, throughout the year. Okay, and that'll be a theme that'll come back. But before I go much further, I'd really like to acknowledge um, that I'm joining you from the ancestral territory. Um, you can see here on this map, I'm right here at the, the intersection of these three. So I'm joining you here from Ontario, Oregon, the Cayuse, Yamatilla, and Walla Walla. Um, today, they're the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. And the Friends of the Owyhee that um, are advocates for conservation of public lands, as well as stewards of that land, and also recreators on that land, uh, which is the entire region down here, which is um, the ancestral territory of the Numa people, the Northern Paiute uh, Shoshone Bannock tribes. So um, if you're not necessarily familiar with, with that, um, either as a concept or familiar with maybe whose territory you are living on, uh, the ancestral territory before European colonization, then I'd highly recommend you visit the website up here, native-land.ca. Uh, um, this is a website, and the first thing that pops up is this map. Um, but this is a website that can help you find um, the kind of the, loosely the ancestral territory of um, the people who were living here before European colonization. Um, and we always like to acknowledge that as um, land stewards and really just as um, decent Americans. I think it's the best thing that we can do 
to um, acknowledge the atrocities of the past, to acknowledge that these people were forcibly removed from their homes, and they also reside here today. These aren't um, people that don't exist anymore, thank goodness, right? Uh, then also, I'd like to direct you um, a little bit more about that to our Friends of the Owyhee website. We have a beautiful tab um, that Catalan um, created a few months ago on equity and inclusion that also includes a beautiful land acknowledgement. Okay, uh, so for tonight's material, um, here's a short outline, but um, I won't cover much of the one, two, and three, uh, or sorry, of the one and two, because these have been covered in other presentations that are archived over it at the Friends of the Owyhee YouTube page. Um, I'll mention it, we'll cover it a little bit, but I really want to focus tonight on number three, the importance of natural night skies. Um, there's a couple of asks that I have of you tonight to you know, download an app on your smartphone uh, that you can actually use uh, for a global citizen science project, okay? Um, and how important it is that we can even um, look out in the night sky and see stars. There are many places around the world that do not have that luxury anymore. And then, um, of course, the meat of tonight's uh, material is I want to uh, look at the constellation Taurus and Aries, uh, talk a little bit about what you're going to see tonight if you happen to um, go out and not have a cloudy night. And then also I wanted to take this, um, you know, this unique time of coming off of about 12 months of these presentations. And then also um, talking a little bit more about the adventure of stargazing throughout the year and some of the observations that you can make by um, taking note of the sky throughout the year. Um, so I'm going to frame that as the cycle of the sun. And then kind of the third component to that, the reason I want to talk about it tonight, is we are right here near the winter solstice and where this, um, the cycle of the sun is actually very important um, and, or, or sort of punctuated at this time of the year where we have the fewest daylight hours of any other time of the year. Okay, um, so that's our outline for tonight. Now, before going uh, much further, I wanted to make a couple of more, uh, more announcements. Um, first of all, the Friends of the Owyhee, we are in the middle of just as many nonprofit organizations that run off of kind hearts like yours that um, the staff, just like me and Catalan here and Tim, our executive director, we pour our hearts into this work, right? Um, it's nonprofit. We're not making millions of dollars. Not that we're scraping by, we're doing our best to run a really healthy and robust organization to do things like this. Okay, um, and that being said, we are in the middle of our end of the year giving campaign. Um, so if you're on our membership or our, our uh, email list, our newsletter list, then you're probably getting some of these announcements. And thank you for reviewing those and reading those. We spend a lot of time sort of philosophically talking about what it is that we want to tell people we're doing. Okay, um, and then we also have memberships available. Um, so those are on our website. You can see our membership levels and sort of what you get in return as being a member um, besides just sort of the, the philosophical improvement to know that you are a friend of the Hawaii and of this landscape. So um, I'd really urge you to, um, if you've been enjoying the stargazing presentations, if you've come on some of our trips, if you just like the idea of of natural night sky preservation or land preservation for plants and animals, uh, then please urge you to, to donate. Even you know $5 goes a long way. I know you probably hear that a lot and you're like, well, $5, but it really does. You know, Sometimes it's just trash bags that we need for the next cleanup and $5 can buy like 25 trash bags. So um, it really does go a long way. And right now your $5 can turn into $15 because we uh, earlier this week, we got news that we got a $5,000 match. So that means that you're, um, we're, we're working up to $5,000 with individual donations. And then once we get that, we get another $5,000 matched. Well, today we heard that we have another $5,000 match. So that means that your $5 can literally be tripled. Your five turns into 15 
for the organization. So please um, consider donating, whether it's through the end of the year campaign, becoming a regular member for next year and donating monthly. It's a pretty easy process. Um, or, you know, whenever you come into your next small chunk of change um, that you can, where it's not, you know, stealing from your own table that you can donate. So that's my, um, my encouragement for donation tonight. So thank you for hearing me out. And uh, then we also like to get together and celebrate. So we have a donor recognition celebration every year. Um, last year, we did that, of course, purely virtually. Um, this year in our community, we feel safe enough, um, as well as staying um, masked and, and many people vaccinated, that uh, we're going to do this in person this year at Burt's Growler Garage, which is uh, one of our um, kind of business members. Um, we did this in 2020 for our very first donor campaign, and we're going to do it again. So January 29th, it's a Saturday from five o'clock to seven o'clock, all of the, the drinks and the food that's bought at Burt's Growler Garage um, is um, will participate in the fundraising. So I think it's about 10% of their um, sales that night, they're gonna donate directly to us. And then besides that, we have a raffle, we have door prizes, we have a silent auction um, to give folks. So if you, you know, are coming to us from Ohio, Sharon, and you don't have a chance necessarily to do that, then uh, we still have other benefits for, uh, for donors that we can um, discuss later. Um, then another um, couple of things going on through the year. As I mentioned, I teach astronomy at Treasure Valley Community College. So if anybody coming um, from the community, whether that's the Treasure Valley wide, uh, Treasure Valley Community College does have some incentives for you to be able to take a class for really low cost or even free in some cases over winter term, just to try out the college thing. So um, if you'd like to join the astronomy class, Mondays, Wednesdays, 4 to 7 p.m., um, I'd love to have you. And then, of course, if you don't want to take that for credit, but you just want to sit in on the class, that's possible, too. Um, that is a live class with a lab and not virtual. Then um, on January 26th, uh, I'm going to go, I'm, I've scheduled to go down to McDermott. Uh, you know, I want to say weather provided, but heck, I'm going to go there no matter what, because the McDermott Library is going to host a stargazing presentation. And we're actually going to go outside and do a little bit of stargazing and use our phones for the globe at night uh, presentation or the, the sorry, the globe at night um, data collection. OK, then a um, couple more the um, stargazing webinars that we've been doing through this year we're going to change the pace of that a little bit. And instead of doing stargazing every month, we're going to alternate every other month. And in between, we're going to do some other kind of science presentation or some other kind of, um, I want to say, well, Owyhee related presentation um, to kind of inspire, you know, a, a little bit more um, imagery around the landscape. So for example, um, Scott Torland from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to join us in February to talk about their uh, bighorn sheep program. So uh, he often goes, I, I actually asked him to come in January, but he was like, oh, I'm going to be out counting sheep. So they actually go regularly out into the Waihi region to uh, count the population of bighorn sheep. So us or really anybody as conservation advocates and, and scientists can understand the impacts of say climate change, the impacts of a hard winter, the impacts of a domestic sheep disease on the bighorn sheep. So Scott Perlin will talk a lot about that. Stay tuned um, for those announcements for what we have together for 2022. Okay, just wanted you to have it on your, your calendar. Then um, the last thing here that we are really excited about, this is a first for us, is we're going to host a backpacking class. And I almost typed in their ultralight backpacking class. Now, they, um, Emmy Elliott and Steve Silva, they will give us a ton of information on gearing up for a more light backpacking scenario. So if you're thinking backpacking, I don't want to carry 70 pounds of gear for three days. That's what they don't want you to think. They want you to show up fresh with no gear, 
and they will help you collect the gear that's going to keep your pack light so you can have a really enjoyable backpacking experience. And this doesn't mean that you're just going to eat, you know, ramen the whole time and sleep only on the ground. I mean, they have a system together where they are nice and warm. They got chairs, they got all the bags they need, uh, and they do it ultra light, which is really cool. Um, so that is composed of three classes on Thursday evenings throughout March and the beginning of April. And then we're going to do a three night, uh, three overnight, uh, four day hiking trip in April on the um, uh, Oregon Desert Trail. Yeah, the ODT from Lake Owyhee to Leslie Gulch. Okay, well, that's it for my announcements. Uh, that took quite a while. So um, number one, uh, you can go back in the archives to look at this stuff a little bit more thoroughly. But I do recommend some gear for stargazing. It's not expensive gear. It's not a lot. It's just some stuff that's going to set you up for a good experience. As it gets colder outside, which is a great time to be out stargazing, you got to dress warm. If you get cold within the first 10 minutes and you're done stargazing, then you miss out on a lot of opportunity. Okay, so that's uh, first thing I'd like to mention. And then um, it's also really important, just like the gear to set yourself up for success, to set your awareness and to make sure that you have a process, right? Just like every morning going to work, you kind of have a process, right? You get up and you shower and you eat breakfast or whatever your process is. You know, maybe it's do yoga before you eat breakfast. I don't know. But having a process for stargazing is, is going to improve your experience. So um, again, look at the archives and I'll, I talked about that in detail in several of the previous lectures, okay? Um, so moving on, I wanted to focus on the importance of natural night skies. Um, this is a, it's hard for me to say that this is a luxury that many of us have um whether again you're in you're in south dakota um and you have access to the to the wide open plains whether you're here in southeastern oregon and some of the darkest um space in the country um it is some type of luxury that we have to be able to access these things and not everybody not everybody has that i mean that's really unfortunate so part of the or the part of the point of the oregon uh Outback Dark Sky Network is like we're doing here, some education around this, both stargazing the constellations, but also education around the dangers of light pollution, right? Um, and it really is a, a danger to the cultural resource that we all share. So uh, these are the things that I'm going to hit, a cultural resource. What do I mean by that? Um, light pollution, kind of what is it and what are some of the solutions to this? Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the citizen science projects that are out there and doing dark sky measurements and how you can get a hold of some instruments to do that. And then um, again about the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network. And so the the end here, the end result is if you're here, you probably like stars, you probably like stargazing, or at least you like the idea of wanting to do that. And if that's the case, then please be a dark sky advocate. And so what does that mean? That means verbally, verbally take this in. Let's talk about light pollution. Let's do what we can to keep the areas of the world that are still dark. Let's keep them dark. Okay. Um, so what do I mean by a cultural resource um, for literally thousands of years, tens of thousands of years? even hundreds of thousands of years, right? Archaeologically, we know that Homo sapiens have been around for 280,000 years. And undoubtedly, our ancestors have been looking at the sky that whole time. And that's just Homo sapiens, right? That's just us, modern day humans. Well, what about our predecessors? Am I saying that animals don't look at the sky? And appreciate it in the same way? No, not necessarily, but we're not going to have the animal consciousness conversation. But let's just focus on us today and us in just the last hundred years. Even in the last hundred years, I guarantee that your grandparents, no matter your age, no matter your generation, let's just talk about your grandparents. They probably knew more about the night sky than you do just inherently. 
whether they heard about it in their school curriculum, whether their parent taught them, whether they sat at, you know, some around the fire meeting at a Girl Scout meeting, I don't know. We know that our, that gener two generations ago, it was more average knowledge for people to have, to find the North Star, to know constellations other than just Orion and the Big Dipper. So that's 50 years, 100 years as a cultural resource that we have lost. I walk into my astronomy class in the first 10 minutes, and that's the first question, right? Well, okay, that's the first series of questions is how many folks can find the Big Dipper? Half of the hands go up. How many folks can find Orion? Maybe a third of the hands go up, maybe two thirds, you know, it depends on the year. How many folks can find the North Star? It's, I'm lucky. Well, well, we are lucky. I don't know. It's, it's nice if I see one hand go up. Usually there's that hesitancy where someone's like, well, I think that I can. Isn't it that one straight up above my head? But remember, the stars rotate. So, of course, it's not that one. Um, and that's a little bit disturbing, right? This, this thing that we as Homo sapiens, our whole entire humanity culture, has had for thousands of years is now become something that is a luxury for us to see. And that's, that's just a little bit sad. So part of what we're doing here is, is education. Let's talk about the stars. Let's learn some constellations. So then you aren't one of those students with their hands down. That's like, yeah, I don't know anything. Right. And then the other side of that education is asking you to become a dark sky advocate for all of us. Right. This is a, a cultural resource throughout um, the ages of humanity. And so, for example, I just have a couple of things up here on the slides. I like to talk, talk about this as the caveman perspective in my class. We take the starship perspective where we go look, you know, using our, our um, probes and satellites, we go look at the other planets and the geology. But we're here with our feet on Earth. And what we do by stargazing, I mean, maybe we use binoculars or a telescope, but with naked eye stargazing, we're doing the same thing that we've been doing as humans for thousands of years. And so over here on the right hand side of the screen, you can see and whether this is the Greco Roman culture down there in the lower right side, you know, where all of the star constellations, scientific star constellations come from today, whether this was the people of Teotihuacan uh, outside of Mexico City that built their, their pyramids in a structure after the cosmos, or even to the right of that, you have the uh, Gaza Strip, the, um, the Egyptian pyramids and the Great Pyramid that are all well known to be designed after certain alignments of constellations. And then um, it's not just um, you know distant cultures, this is cultures here in North America as well. So here's um, a book of Lakota star knowledge that we talked about a little bit last, um, last month um, on the legend um, around the Ursa Major um, and the Pleiades constellation. And then in the very top picture there, you have Stonehenge, and then I have this cave painting, or actually it's this replica of this cave painting that is interpreted. You can see this person here who's kind of interpreted as, um, as probably being uh, you know, a shaman in their tribe or something kind of like that. The terminology shaman probably isn't appropriate, but you know what I mean, the, the medicine person in their tribe. This seems to be wearing a blanket that is draped in stars is how anthropologists interpret this. And then over here on the upper right hand corner, we have um, the star or the, the story that I'll talk a little bit about tonight about the cycle of the sun um, at the winter solstice time. So again, this is a cultural resource for all of us. And that's why we believe in preservation of that cultural resource. So let's talk a little bit about light pollution and solutions. Um, you can use this map here by the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder to um, to look at the effect that light pollution has had around the world. OK, now I shifted to North America because um, that's where most of us are coming from and not to be like, you know, US centric or anything. But uh, you can see, boom, over there on the eastern seaboard, it is just light polluted and there's no going back. OK, not that not that it's I want to say it's a lost cause or anything. I'm so glad that those folks can still see some stars. I think there's like six stars you can see from downtown New York City 
during the year. So Sirius, you know, like the star Sirius is one of those. Um, but over here in Western North America, we have these beautiful, big, amazing pockets of darkness. And we do not want to see those invaded by more light pollution. It's not like we're talking about a city being put in the middle of these things. I mean, the cities are where they are. What we're talking about is the, the glow of the cities that are emanating into this darkness. So um, identifying some of these areas is um, first in that process. So um, identifying the dark night or the dark sky areas. And then um, one way to combat this or a solution to invading light pollution is making is using lighting that makes sense. OK, first of all, uh, then another um, part of this process, just like I was saying, identifying the areas is let's identify them, draw a circle around them and call it a dark sky place. And there's a dozen different ways to do this there. Every week, there's a new news article coming out describing one of, of a new dark sky place, okay? Um, so here's some of those lighting solutions. Here's what unshielded light looks like, okay? Where you have light emanating up into space where nobody's gonna use it. And then you can cap that light, you can partially shield it, or what is recommended, right? To get the most out of the dark night skies, you can fully shield the light and point the light down at the ground where we're actually going to use it, okay? Um, and again, on these dark sky places, the central Idaho dark sky preserve was one of the really big, the first big ones in the United States. Um, Sun River, a town in Oregon has recently designated literally their, their community. Um, state parks have designated these national parks have designated these. So there are many different ways for a community to become engaged in this work and say, we're going to do this. Okay, so for example, if you happen to live, you know, near Minnesota and you live uh, near um, Blue Mounds State Park or something like this, uh, that can be a dark sky preserve or, or sanctuary or a park based on what are the appropriate boundaries, what the land management agency is and what they, um, what they're willing to do. And so all that means, any of these things through the International Dark Sky um, Network is really advocating that we're going to do one thing, and that's any new lights that are put in, we're going to make them fully shielded. And for those lights that are existing in that quadrangle today, we're going to slowly, well, hopefully within 10 years, I think are the, is the standards, we're going to work up to 90% of those lights being shielded. And this isn't legally binding. I think that's really important to say too. It's not like anybody's going to get sued. Anybody's going to get go to jail for this or anybody's going to get their land taken away. It's not legally binding, right? This is a pact between all of us to share this culture or to preserve this cultural resource, okay? Now, one comment here is that we must have data, real data to support this. So the last image that I showed you was computer data or satellite data um, that is, is using an algorithm to show light pollution. But really, um, so here's yeah, that same map. And this polygon that's up here in blue is the Oregon Outback's dark sky network generally area. Now it goes into Nevada, it goes into Idaho. But you can see the black, 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 black stuff that's here. And that is what we are trying to preserve. So any of these smaller lights that are in here, any of the country lights, any of the barn lights, and particularly uh, the public land that's out here, like the BLM, if they have a guard station that's out there, we're just saying, please, will you put shielded lights there that aren't going up to space and let's keep this area dark. Uh, and that's why we, as friends of the UI here, are officially on the steering committee for the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network as we're doing our best um, to do this work. But you can do it too, right? Um, to figure out exactly how dark, whether it's in Malheur County, Harney County, Lake County, or, you know, Minnehaha County, uh, you know, you can get a hold of a sky quality meter and you can um, use this pretty simple device to calculate or to, to take a measurement of how dark the sky is. 
Um, so here in Malheur County, we have these available at the Ontario Community Library. There's two of these kits available that you can check out. Uh, and in Harney County, I think there's also one or two kits available that can be checked out. And po uh, possibly we can get these in Vail, we can get these in McDermott, we can get these down in Jordan Valley. Um, so we can get these in the hands of people who live within this Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network to really gather that data to figure out how dark this stuff is. Um, and it's really easy to submit the data. Um, here are the open data collection periods. We are creeping up on um, the last of these. Actually, I don't see the last of these uh, listed here. I did pull out the, um, I believe it's December 25th to uh, like January 3rd, that date. Uh, there we go. Yeah, December 25th to January 3rd to look at Orion using the Globe at Night and it's seriously really easy, right? If you've done you know, any texting before, it's just as easy as that. So you pull up the app, you uh, put in, it takes your GPS, you put in your observations, which includes how many stars you can see around the Orion constellation. It literally gives you a picture. Can you see these ones, these ones, or these ones? And you click the one that you can see. Um, you put in the sky conditions, whether it was cloudy or hazy. Um, and if you have access to a sky quality meter, you enter that data. If you don't, that's okay too, because the number of stars that you can see or the magnitude that's visible to your naked eye is a proxy for how dark the sky is. So that data even uh, itself even works for the citizen science project. So I urge you to go ahead and download um, or, or go ahead and visit their website, theglobeatnight.com. Uh, there's also, as a um, here, there's an app loss of night that is also a good one to use. But I, I really highly recommend for all of the data that you collect through loss of night, lot to go over to globeatnight.org. Excuse me, not .com. Um, and fiddle around with it tonight, right? Get ready for this post Christmas into New Year's um, data collection. All right. Okay, well, um, we are, let's see, 6.06, and so that means I have plenty of time then, um, and I'm getting a little bit warm. I don't know why I didn't take my jacket off before, folks, but um, we have plenty of videos archived over at the YouTube page um, that you can check out, so I'm not going to necessarily recap a whole lot of the previous lectures because they are archived there. So please, um, you know, visit the link or use your Google skills um, to go check that out. Um, I do want to recognize what we did last month in November, uh, which, um, well, we did a couple of different things, but uh, this you can still do this month. I mean, it just barely, just barely. Uh, so I like to I like to say good night summer triangle and good morning winter circle. Uh, you know, the sun goes down absurdly early. It's like 5:20 when it gets dark here, and then it doesn't come up until like 7:20 the next morning. So chances are you're already awake when it's dark out in the morning or in the evening, and it just takes a glance out the window or when you're out there starting your car to go take off in the morning or maybe if you you know, or scraping your windows if you live in one of those places, then um, take a look at the um, western horizon during just after sunset, and you can see some of the stars of the summer triangle going down. Um, so Vega and Altair are still, um, still visible, um, but Deneb is like right there on the horizon. If you have a really good view of the horizon, you can probably still see it. Okay, um, so that's the summer triangle that's going down in the evening. And then as you wake up in the morning, you know, going out there to get ready for work or go to drive to the coffee shop, uh, you can start to see the familiar stars of the winter circle coming up over the horizon. Um, so that includes, and we'll review all of this again in January. I can't believe it's already been a year. Um, but we'll uh, take a look at the winter circle again. And um, tonight, I'll talk a little bit about one of those constellations, the Taurus constellation, that has the red star Aldebaran, okay, the eye of the bull. Um, so let's start there at Aldebaran. If you go counterclockwise over to Capella, 
Uh, then around the circle to the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux, uh, two twin stars that are about equal brightness. Um, and then down from those, you get to Procyon or Canis Minor, the little dog. And then to Sirius or um, Canis Major, the big dog. And Sirius, as I joked with earlier, that you can see that from New York, seriously. Um, that is the brightest star in the sky. I mean, excluding the things that are bright that are not stars, like the moon and the planet Venus. Um, Sirius is the brightest object in the night sky. Okay, and I mentioned that uh, not only because it's in the winter circle, but, um, you know, again, imagine this is our cultural resource, right? Our television for thousands of years that we've been looking at. And the brightest star in the night sky, I would imagine is pretty important, right? I mean, it's important to me and I have a television and a smartphone. Uh, but the star Sirius has likely been observed, again, by all peoples in um, the Northern Hemisphere and, and uh, near equatorial latitudes for thousands of years. And it's likely that that star, because it's so bright and it's so prominent, um, has found its way into a lot of folklore and mythology. So that comes into the conversation a little bit later tonight. Um, and then as you go, uh, keep going around the circle, we get to Rigel, which is the lower right knee of the constellation Orion. And so I've put in here for reference the three stars of Orion's belt, and then the upper uh, right shoulder of um, Orion, which is the star Betelgeuse. Um, and it's kind of got a reddish, orangish tinge to it, and it's a pretty big, bright star, and it falls almost in the middle of this big thing we call the winter circle. And it's important to say um, that the winter circle is not a constellation. Uh, it's what we might call an asterism, uh, just like the Big Dipper. Um, it's something that we know, we can see, we can connect the dots, and it's some kind of like friendly word of mouth thing between you and I but it's not a scientific constellation. Um, Taurus, which includes the star Aldebaran, is a constellation. Orion is a constellation. So the winter circle here is actually made up of uh, several constellations and the brightest stars of those constellations that you can see in the wintertime. And um, I just wanted to cover that a little bit more, more thoroughly tonight because this is the winter circle season. I mean, tonight, the sun's already down where I'm at. I can walk outside and I can already see Orion up and give it another, you know, hour and Sirius will be up too. So winter circle season is now. Uh, so um, tonight, or well, tomorrow morning, you can, um, let's see, no, tomorrow night, you can say good night to uh, the summer triangle as it's heading down. And as you wake up in the morning, if you look back over there to the west, the, the whole winter circle will be there. Okay. Now, the other thing that we covered last month, oh yeah, I wanted to, I, I, I like to make this distinction, excuse me. Astronomy is not astrology. Okay. Many of you, um, you know, maybe not many of you specifically, just many of us in general, we hear of the constellations as like, oh, I'm a Scorpio. Oh, you know, you're a Capricorn. And they, we have this kind of in our common lexicon around us today. Um, now, those constellations are totally real, totally out there for real. So I'm not, um, I'm not, but I'm not doing astrology here. We're doing astronomy. We're actually looking at those real constellations. And one of the distinctions is the, the idea or the perception or the concept that the stars actually have an effect on your personality. Okay. And that's kind of a belief system. Um, even if that belief system is thousands of years old or traditional or, you know, there's other arguments uh, about this. And I'd love to have the conversation sometime, but I just want to make that distinction that even though tonight we're talking about constellations that happen to coincide with those zodiac constellations, and I'm going to talk about a star story, what we're not doing here is astrology, okay? Um, but... I do believe in the importance of creating a narrative around 
the stars, the placement, where they're at, how far they are from one another, how, how they fit together, and their movement is what we're going to talk about tonight. And that, stitching a story together, is what helps our human brain. That's who we are, right? We are storytellers. We are story listeners, right? We enjoy this stuff and it helps us remember. And so I ask, is this remembering or is this just internalizing the world around you, right? Internalizing that, you know, you have a shadow on that side because the sun is on that side, right? There are just these things that we begin to internalize about our natural world as we grow some perception around them. And so um, is that really, is that, is that remembering or internalizing? And really that's just a different way of knowing things. So there's a scientific way to know things by rigorously collecting data, by creating hypotheses and testing and going through this rigorous process to get to the 95% confidence level to answer a question. But there's other ways to know things as well, and that's through internalizing and living. So, uh, for instance, um, we can we can call that uh, native science is one way to refer that to that internalizing that way of knowing by oral tradition and word of mouth. And last month we talked, um, or I talked about the um, Ursa Major and Pleiades myth. And really just doing that as a way to help you internalize the movement of these constellations, not necessarily the origins. I gave a big origin story kind of thing that's from one specific culture uh, and attributed to the Lakota culture. And we talked a little bit about that, but this is a way to get to know that um, a little bit differently. Oh, I didn't realize I kept that slide around. Okay. Aw, good slide. Okay. But um, tonight... In the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, in the spirit of the winter solstice, um, the, the visible cycles of the sky. And that's during the day and the night in this case. So here's um, a picture of the, the Earth. Um, from our perspective, we see the sun going around us. Of course, that's not reality, right? I'm not, that's not what I'm saying here, trying to argue here. Uh, but from our perspective, this is a good way to look at this, um, to look at how the equinox um, affects or, or it, it comes from the equinox and solstice come from the tilt of our planet. Now, um, you can think about this as the annual movement of the sun or and I put this in quotes because this is a little bit more storyteller like the death and rebirth of the sun that happens every single year like clockwork. In fact, that's what clocks are based on. That's what the calendar is based on. Um, so first, though, we should acknowledge what you're actually going to see as you go out tonight. Uh, many of you have probably already been looking at these planets for the last month, just as I have as the sun goes down. So uh, just right out there, I can almost see it out through the window. You can see uh, Venus. The one of the brightest objects besides the moon in the night sky, and it's a planet. Um, you can see Venus just trailing behind the sun. And then we'll skip over Saturn, but up there is Jupiter that's also fairly bright, and it's up there right behind it is the um, Aquarius constellation. And then, okay, I won't skip over Saturn. Uh, Saturn lies between them, but the way that you're going to find Saturn isn't by looking for it. It's by looking in context of the other two planets. So that's why I wanted to skip it at first. Uh, all of these objects fall along the ecliptic, right? The path that the sun takes throughout the sky. And again, that's from our perspective. But why exactly is that, right? Well, because the solar system is in a large disk around the sun. Okay, we all orbit around the sun in the same disk. It's not like one is going this way and one is going this way. No, it's all in one large disk. So therefore, from our perspective, when we're looking towards the sun, that's on the same adjacent or the same plane if we were to turn around and look towards Jupiter. So they actually fall all in a line. Oh, wow. And now think of this in, in context of how we communicate sometimes. We're like, when the planets align, well, they're always in a line, right? 
Uh, in reality, they are actually always in the night sky in a line. What's rare is when we actually get to see those things um, line up. Or, or sorry, not line up, but actually get to see all seven of the planets. Okay, uh, so I wanted to point those out. And then um, tonight, the um, portions of the winter circle that are coming up, uh, you can see um, Aries and Taurus tonight. So I'll use my cursor first, but if you can find the moon, which should be totally unavoidable tonight, then you can see um, the bright reddish star towards the east that is the eye of the bull. That's the V that's right here. Um, of the Taurus constellation. And that V, if you extend it out, so Aldebaran, if I extend out that same angle, I get to a faint star. That's the tip of the horn. And if I go in the other direction, you get to the tip of the horn. So there's the horns, there's the eye of the bull, there's the chin. And then up here you have, there's the Pleiades constellation. Up here you have kind of the body of the bull, okay? And the leg down here. Then on the other side of the moon, you have the Aries constellation. It's a little bit tricky. So um, I'm going to forward through these. Okay, there's, um, again, once again, Aldebaran, or uh, sorry, Taurus and Pleiades. And you can see that on Stellarium, how that kind of looks. But let's go to Aries. I find one of the most reliable ways to find Aries is to actually find this constellation first the uh, triglinium or triangulum, excuse me, uh, that makes a right triangle out there in the sky. So lucky enough, we have the moon to navigate with tonight. And if you go um, about 18 degrees um, straight up towards the zenith from the moon, so 18 degrees is about a whole hang loose. If you go 18 degrees, degrees above, you'll see this right triangle of triglinium. Then between those two, the bright, two bright stars, make um, the horns of the ram and then there's a faint star that makes up the eye and then if you go um it's only like seven or eight degrees towards the horizon um or sorry towards aldebaran from um the two bright stars you'll get to the back side um the little triangle that's right here of the ram um oftentimes you'll find in a lot of the constellations the back side of the animals is a triangle because one of those represents the the spine or the top of the spine the sacrum one of those represents the kind of the lower rump or like the sit bones you might think of it and then the upper one represents the tail so like leo the lion you'll see that the back side is a triangle um uh aries you'll see that the back side is a triangle Okay. And then also for reference in here, if you go way over to another star um, that's as equal brightness as Fomalt, um, the star here in Aries, then uh, you went too far because that's the star Algol of, um, of uh, Medusa. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. You're turned to stone. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the cycles of the sun. And here's the awareness that we'll set. Um, look over to the east where the sun rises. You can do this all year round, and I suggest that you go ahead and start doing that tonight, or, well, the sun's already set, but you start doing that tomorrow morning. Um, today, the sun sets around 520, and it rises around 720. The moon is almost full. It's full on Saturday night. Uh, get your full moon groove on. Uh, and then the process here is to um, go ahead and find a place that you can repeatedly go at sunrise, designate a location that you can see the eastern horizon. Then from your point of view, mark on the ground the direction east. And then um, once a month, it only once a month is fine, you can go out and you can notice where the sun rises with respect to east. Um, and then you can also note the constellations that come that are in the night sky before the sun rises. Okay, and why would you do all of this? Well, because I'm suggesting it for one. It's a fun process to do, but there's actually something behind this. There's a big story that I want to illuminate here. So let's start with this. During the summer solstice, in the middle of the summer, when the sun rises, if you're looking over here at the east and the sun's rising, it's way over there. It's what we call north of east. Okay, hopefully you can imagine that. It's down here in the image. There's E, the red E, and then here's sunrise. Well, a little bit after sunrise, and it's way over here north of east. 
okay? But throughout the year, the sun gradually rises east and then finally south of east, okay? Now, I made a note here um, that in Stellarium, I've turned off the atmosphere. That's a function that you can do. So the atmosphere is what scatters the sun's light and makes it appear all bright outside. Um, if we were to be like, you know, Mercury and not have an atmosphere, then when we look up in the night sky, we would see the sun as just basically a big bright star. Okay, kind of like the moon or something like this. So um, I've turned off the atmosphere so we can actually look at the, the constellations when the sun is rising. Okay, so the sun is rising north of east, but on the equinox, it rises right smack dab on east and it sets right smack dab on west. Okay, and then this time of year, here we have the date calendar down here, if you didn't already see that, 1221, about a week away. At sunrise, the sun comes up very far south of east. Okay, so that's part of the story here. I just wanted to illuminate that, that the cycle of the sun is actually, it, it, in the summer solstice, it rises north of east and it makes this giant arc and it sets north of west. But in the winter time, it rises south of east, makes this teeny little witty arc and it sets um, south of west. Okay, now here's poor, uh, part of the story part is I went ahead and put in the constellations here. So um, adding constellation observations back in October, I just chose my birthday because, you know, that's my birthday. Uh, but you could choose anywhere between October 15th and the 31st, where the sun actually, for the first time during the year, um, touches the Virgo constellation or in the part of the story, I'm going to refer to it as the Virgin. Okay. And then about a month later, um, if you look at the sun's position with respect to the rest of the constellations behind it, there's the scorpion, okay? There's Antares, the heart of the scorpion, and then there's the claws. And so it appears that the scorpion has bitten the sun, or I guess um, in some cultures, this is referred to as a kiss um, because the bite of the scorpion or the penetration of the scorpion often makes two little, little holes, um, so bitten by the scorpion. And then for three days afterwards, over here on the right-hand side of the screen, 20th, 21st, 22nd, for three days, the sun stands still. It appears to die in the sky. It's not going that way, south of east, and it's not going that way, north of east. Okay, it appears to rise in the same location every day. But by Christmas, it's clear that the sun rises further to the north. On Christmas. So we have this kind of this image then that during the winter solstice, the sun might go away. It might not ever rise and become summer again. But on Christmas, we get to all celebrate that, yes, the sun has come back and it will now continue on its march up to the north. Okay, wonderfully. Now, on sunset, the night before Christmas, otherwise known as Christmas Eve, right? If you look over to the east during sunset, then um, you can watch the Orion constellation come up. And if you watch Orion come up, or the three stars of the King Orion, then uh, and you see Sirius come up over the horizon, as I mentioned earlier, it's about to do that, then the straight line between um, the three stars and Sirius actually marks the precise location. I mean, it's within two degrees the location on the horizon where the sun will rise the next morning, okay? Now, just imagine that. Any other geometry to this, and the sun isn't going to come up in that exact location. This is very peculiar or very particular orientation to just this couple of days at this time of year, and I think that's amazing. And then if you wait until sunrise in the morning, the main constellation that you're going to see just a couple of hours before the sun rises is guess who? The Virgo constellation rises at about um, two o'clock in the morning to seven hours later. So um, all in all, that story might sound familiar. Um, it is um, anthropologically referred to as the Christmas story. Um, so we have in the Christmas story, we talk about the Christmas star. 
and anthropologically and, and biblical scholars looking at that, we've never really been able to, and, and astronomers, line up exactly what the Christmas star probably was. Some hypotheses are that it was a supernova um, that, uh, that uh, occurred about that time, but also anthropologically, many folks refer to this cycle of the sun and these unique orientations of all the constellations that find their way into this Christmas story as the origins and the reason for the season. Um, and I think that's really beautiful and it's really elegant. And it gives me, you know, um, as, a, as a stargazer, as a geoscientist, more emphasis behind this whole season where I can look at the sun and this cycle throughout the whole year, knowing that winter is coming, that we get this unique Christmas time, and then we're going to have summer again at some time soon. And I'm sure that agricultural peoples who invented the, or not invented this story, who started telling this story, referred to it in the same way. So again, this is an example of the stars being a rich cultural resource for all of humanity. Okay. Um, so with that, oh, I didn't change the date up here. Um, let's do this again in January. It'll be about January 16th or something like that. And um, maybe the 17th. And I hope to see you again. It'll be stargazing in January. And then after that, we'll do one of our science topics and then we'll rotate back to stargazing and so on and so forth. So um, I really enjoyed getting to do this throughout the year um, and really enjoy to see a lot of people coming back. And um, I'll stop it right there for any questions. Uh, I'll look over here in the comments. Let's see. And if I don't see any in the comments, you're welcome to go ahead and, um, and ask. Okay, it looks like I, didn't, I don't see any comments since about 5.30 from Casey Brown. Hi, hi, JC Combs from Idaho. Well, good. Um, if you do have a question, go ahead and unmute and you can ask your question uh, verbally. If not, then we'll hang out for a little bit. Uh, Lupe says, interesting presentation. Thank you so much. You bet. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure. And for all of you, including you, Lupe, I hope you're able to go out into the night sky and apply some of this that you saw tonight, whether that's looking at the planets, looking at the, the eye of the bull, Aldebaran, or even tomorrow, like watching the Christmas story happen in front of your eyes. It's really beautiful. It's really cool. Okay. Uh, Janet says, thanks for the information. Okay. It doesn't look like anybody's... Um, jumping up for a question or unmuting. So uh, I guess we're, we're done there. Thanks a lot, folks. Um, really enjoy getting to hang out with you once a month here and uh, hope you come back next time. Okay. And if you're looking for uh, the review of the presentation, it'll be up on YouTube in the next week or so. Okay. Give us a little bit of time, uh, but we'll put it up there um, soon. And then you can also see the archives that are there. Okay, Kelsey Taylor says, thank you. Kelsey, good to see, it's been a long time. Good to see you here. Glad you found, found out about this. And then um, Sharon says, is it true that stars twinkle and planets uh, don't? Yes, uh, for, the, for the most part. Now, um, Saturn or some of the fainter um, planets, you know, it's really the atmosphere and the distance that the, that light travels. I mean, starlight is traveling through light years where planet which is light that's reflected off of the sun and back to us that's within like light hours so um the light to get to us is much shorter so the disturbance um through that space is much shorter so you won't see any of that that wave interference where stars because they're so darn far away there is actually some interference and the stars will, you'll see them twinkle as you say, but they'll get a little bit brighter and a little bit dimmer. And it's hard to pick up um, unless it's on like a really big star like uh, Sirius or Betelgeuse and you'll see those change a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I guess it's a decent rule of thumb, but um, I think a much better way to tell the difference between a planet and um, a star is to really do what we're doing here tonight, is you got to go outside with that awareness and that process, do a little bit of study before you go out. And then when you go out, 
you can see what you planned on seeing and then things that you have questions about, write those questions down, bring it back inside, go to your Stellarium app or go to your book, your stargazing book or go to your star wheel. Okay. Something like that. And that can help you answer the question for sure. So it's a fine rule of thumb, but really there's better ways to, to determine that. Okay. Um, so once you know the position of the planets, like when you know that those, the Venus is out there tonight, um, it's unmistakable. You'll be able to track those for months and for years, and you'll never be fooled by anyone telling you like, oh, I think that's a star. Oh, no, that's a planet. You'll know. Okay. Long-winded answer there. All right, folks. Well, we really appreciate it. Yeah, Kelsey, it has been a little while. I think uh, 2011 or maybe 2013. So Kelsey, I, I think you were a, uh, you're a University of Oregon undergraduate geology student. You did the, she did the um, or uh, geology field camp. And I want to say that was like 2013. Okay, really cool. Well, that's really great. I I remember um, talking about the book, Robert Louvre, um, uh, Last Child in the Woods with you um, in environmental education. So I hope you have a chance these days to be uh, working with kids and inspiring um, folks to get in the outdoors. All right, folks. Well, I think I'll let you all go and we'll see you next time.